Well, we praise God from whom all blessings flow, and it's just good to be here once again to spend time with the people of God as we engage this time of pastoral Bible study fellowship. And I want to thank you for sharing with me thus far this year. Guess what? We have tonight, this third Tuesday of December, and then <clears throat> next, next, the next Tuesday, the Tuesday after um, ooh, Christmas, we're done for 2022. Isn't that something? Wow. And here we are. Well, we, we need to finish. <laughs> I guess what I'm saying out loud is we need to finish these, uh, these verses. Uh, Zechariah chapter 9, we're at around verse 13. I'm going to back up and just say some reviewing things about verse 12. And we're going to try to get verse 13 and 14 and 15 partial and then do 16 and 17 and see if we can uh, finish up in the next two weeks. How does that sound? Okay. All right. So I, I hope everything is going well. Hey, uh, members of Tabernacle uh, who've been with me for a while, you've heard me say this. I know this is the season where you want to make sure that your family is all right, the children are receiving some types of gifts and trying to be <clears throat> charitable to people who are less fortunate than you are. And I just wanted to remind us that let's do that with, with decency, with honesty, with integrity, and without putting yourself in any financial harm or hardship for one day that may be misrepresented because it ain't about making other people happy per se, but it's about remembering that is a day set aside to remember that God wrapped himself in human flesh. God wrapped, presented himself, and placed himself in the womb of Mary, the virgin, and was born into the world as the savior of the world. He came to save us from our sins. You know, that's, that's the Christmas story. Mm -hmm. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. That's the, that's the herald that we ought to be, you got it, that we ought to be giving. Because uh, uh, Puget Sound Energy, Seattle City Light, Seattle Public Utilities, Tacoma Gen General and Public Utilities, Snohomish, uh, they, the, them utility company, they don't care about what you thought your children had to have. Look, there is a December 26th, God willing, that comes out the December 25th, and you need to be ready to live their heart. So um, just be wise, be circumspect, keep it about Christ, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Got it? Now, nah, this probably is not the most dynamic way for me to say that, but that's just what I feel tonight as we get ready to get into the Word of God. So don't get carried away by the hustle and the bustle. Slow down, dear heart. Just thank God He loved you enough to come into this world to save you from your sins. So Zechariah chapter 9, verse 12, we're going to begin and see how far we can go through, hopefully, verses 13, 14, and part of 15. Let's pray. Eternal Father, tonight we thank you uh, for the privilege, again, to give exposition of truth. And if you would open our ears, our hearts, and our minds, we would commit to live thereby. Bless the people that they've gathered for this purpose. Sanctify this time and this moment for us. And we'll praise you for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Flowers fade, grass withers, but the word of our Lord remains forever. So here in Zechariah chapter 9, verses 11 through 17, this section of the scripture again is titled in the New King James Version of the Bible, God will save his people, or the God that saves his people. And this is a reference to God saving Israel, who's been in Babylonian exile. And we know that in uh, the book of Zechariah and some of the previous books, people have started returning from that exile. They're working on rebuilding the temple, rebuilding their lives, reestablishing priesthood. They're trying to get back to some kind of normal uh, after this time being spent away, 70 years. And we've spent so many good conversations about that. And here we are at the end of another year, some say at the end of the third year of the pandemic. 
And we're trying to get back in a lot of ways. Y you follow what I'm saying? Not 70 years, just a little over two years and uh, two and a half years, but it feels like how do we get back? And, and will God meet us? And will God be gracious to us like he was unto his people? Uh, the short answer would be is that God is no respect of person. And what grace he's shown to one, he will show to another. But he's speaking directly to those who are still in Babylon, how he's going to lift them from the pit, the centuries, and how he's going to bless them. Now, in verse 12, I want to say this just one more time. The scripture reads, and this is another translation. Turn you, return to the stronghold or your fortress. Ye, O you prisoners of who have the with hope. What is hope? Verse 12, Zechariah 9, verse 12. The hope of being released. That, that's what this is about. The Jews' hope of being released from captivity. Like he's just talked about in verse 11. God now tells them, have this great hope of release. Even the day, this is the very day today, even now, do I declare, I announce, God is saying all this, that I will render, I will restore, I will return Double, remember we spoke about that briefly last week. Double, twice as much unto thee what was taken from you. Boy, somebody just need to just, I mean, put it in context now. Because <laughs> some of us would be right here trying to demand of God. Pastor Manway said that if I do so and so, you'll give me double. And, we, and, we, and you out of context. That's not what, that's not what we're saying. This, Oh, if the church could just get away from always wanting God to hook us up and always wanting something for nothing. I mean, God is, God is hopeful that 70 years has provided his people with appropriate healthy space, S-P-A-C-E, to repent of the attitudes, dispositions, and things that got them sent there. Got it? So in my life and your life, if we want to use this comparison of how God is trying to talk to his people who are still somewhere, but he's going to release them because he's about to fulfill a word he spoke. God said you'll be there 70 years, you know. Jeremiah 29, 11, I, I know the plans I have, you plans to do you good and not eat. God, God, God says, but I'm going to bring you into a, a good place. Got it. God said that. But they are there because of hard-heartedness, disobedience, mistreatment of the poor that were among them, classism among them, religious arrogance among them, unfaithful priest teachers, elders, and civic and spiritual leadership got them there. So has 70 years been enough time and have they used the space appropriate to consider all the things that got them there so that when they are released, God says you will be favorable unto if it were double. I restore. Child of God, God never takes nothing without having the, the wherewithal or the grace or even the power to give you more than what you thought you lost. That's, that's Job's story. What if Job's story, Joseph, would have stopped at the end of chapter 3? What if we never got those wonderful lessons of chapters 38 through 42 in the book of Job? He went through before he got Hmm. Say it one more time for me. Job went through all those things, and at the end, then he received. I'm Trinitarian. <laughs> Job lost everything he had that was dear, precious to him. Even his health and strength, to the point that some days he felt like dying. 
To the point some days he got weak, he said, God, kill me now before I say something stupid, before I talk crazy to you. He went through all of those things. And at the end of remaining faithful, even in trials, circumstances, beyond his control, God restored him and gave him more than what he had to begin. I, that, that, that just all is settling it for some of us. It's not a blank check. It's if I've learned my lessons, if I've repented, if I've done what God requires, then God will be favored to acknowledge my faithfulness and my righteousness. And so in verse uh, 12, this last statement here seems to indicate that God is being literal. <laughs> These prisoners will have to have had things taken from them by their enemies. But at this point, their enemies will be subdued and their king will be ruling the whole world. Jesus Christ, Messiah, ruling the whole world. And they are going to be not just released, but they will all be a part of the things that God would be restoring because of them. Right now, the Lord had said earlier in the same text, a passage of scripture, that there won't be any wars or any more weapons in the new world, in the new dispensation, the new millennium, right? Bowls, war horses, and chariots, will all be a thing of the past. But that doesn't stop the Lord from speaking or using humans as his weapons. That's where we now look quickly at verse 13. Read with me. When I, or for I, I have, I will, I bend, I bent, said the Lord Judah, for me, as my bow, as my bent bowl, I filled it, I loaded them with Ephraim, my arrows. Got it? He used one group of his people as the bow. He used another group of his people as the arrows. Bow and arrow. Got it? Judah is my bow. Ephraim is my arrow. Raise them up, stir them up. I got the sons of Zion back excited against the sons of, look, Greece. Now you're talking about adversaries. And I made with them, I made Zion like a sword of a mighty man, a warrior's sword. So let's see what is he saying in verse 13. Now, this is, by, by the way, um, where we have some guidance as to whom uh, the Lord um, is speaking of back in the first part of the chapter. Now, remember, I've mentioned that he's talking about Greece coming down and attacking Hamath and Hatherick, and then a few Philistine cities along the coast, Alexander the Great. But up until this point, we have no idea who the king there is who's supposed to lead the army to do those things. But now we can hear what nation the Lord is speaking of, speaking of Greece. And some of the references to Greece are hysterical, especially what we see earlier in the chapter, like those things were going to happen after Zephaniah's or Zechariah's, not Zephaniah, Zechariah's time but yet for our vantage point had already happened and they are historical even to Zechariah at this point. Now, in verse 13, we have to look at verse 13 then. Stay with me, y'all. I know this is what I called two weeks ago, dry preaching. In essence, verse 13 can be looked at as things that have already happened not things that are going to happen but things that have already happened say with me see some things prophesized uh, being 
some things that were prophesied have already happened. Say that. Got it? Say some things that are prophesied have not yet happened. Okay, got it? They say we mean some things prophesied are beginning to happen. Mm -hmm. So this has already happened. And, and why that? Well, it seems to me that when we read about Judah and Ephraim, really never could be said to have been uh, a literal bow and an arrow against Greece. They were, they, were, they were too weak to fight against Alexander the Great. And, and, during, uh, and since the time of Zechariah, Zion has never really been like a sword. Israel has never been this great mega power, mega nation. But contemporarily, she's been so strengthened and so modern. Remember, this little nation, Israel, is only about the size of the state of New Jersey, I believe, when we talk about giving a reference point to the size and might of, uh, of how Israel, the nation, the real landmass looks. And all around her are potential enemies, people who would come against her at any moment. But God has blessed her with contemporary weaponry to protect herself. So as if God is still hovering over them and protecting them, even in the time that we speak. But the Jews did rise up in history against Rome, and they rose up against them, against the Roman occupationists, patientists rather, <laughs> about 70 years after Jesus' birth. But they were put down by Roman military might. And I can't think of a time when Israel could have attacked and defeated Greece any time in history. So I see these things as being at the end of the tribulation right before the millennial kingdom would happen. And so this nation that had caused grief and fear to God's people, what nation? Greece, Rome. God's people had been going through the turmoils with this nation in particular for, since 3300, not 33, since 300 BC, at a time yet future to us would be defeated by the nation of Israel. And how is that? How is it that Israel, who has been so relatively, po relatively powerless for so many centuries that they would be in the position to attack and destroy Greece. Good question mark. This is, this is prophecy. So let's look at verse 14 and we'll quit for the day. Verse 14. It reads, And then the Lord who sees, appears, who is above all them of his error shall go forth as lightning. And the Lord shall blow the trumpet and shall, my God, go, march, be with them as a whirlwind, as a storm, as it winds to the south. Let's look at this. This is, very, this is good. The Lord shall oversee them. So, in this particular passage, then, in verse 14, this particular verse, not passage, in this particular verse, the arrow that God has just described as being Ephraim, he's going to shoot it. God is going to come from the south, this is prophetic language, come from the south in Israel up to the north to Greece. And it's at the fact that the Lord would be with the people and over the people that would cause him to be them, Israel, so mighty. God would be with them. Paul talks about this a little bit in the book of Romans chapter 8 when he talks about, is it verse 30 or verse 31, Sister Margaret? Uh, uh, if, if God be for us, who can be against us? You plus God is a majority. I don't know. What is in the in the modern church? We're so finicky until <laughs> uh, too many of us have Gideon syndrome. We want to know how many folk with us before we do anything. How many folk feel like I feel before I make a commitment? Now, uh, once again, here's one of those 
Be wise, be discerning, because even Jesus himself says, uh, you, you ought to count up the cost. You ought to know how many folk you got with you and none before you go out and declare a war against another king who got 20,000 folk and you just got 10. So, you know, that they have some common sense. Got what I'm saying? But, but as far as making a commitment to serving the church or the stewardship or anything, supporting the work of God, why do I always have to check in with five or six other people before I make the commitment to? Why can't I just say, if this is the will of God, then let me do it out of a clear conscience with a good spirit and a good heart to the glory of God. What happened to the Colossians story that Paul talks about? So whatever your hands find to do, do it heartily unto the Lord as serving God and not men. And in the years to come, in the time to come, this small nation had always been oppressed by those great nations that surrounded her. One day, the king of glory will actually be in her midst, will be leading them, will be guiding them as a general guides and army. And they will be supremely dominant because the Lord will be with them. He will be fighting the battle as he will be with them. Let's conclude tonight because we're down to verse 15. And, and uh, ma no, wait, let's do this. It's all right. Let's, let's read verse 15. The Lord of hosts who rules over all, the Lord Almighty shall defend, guard, shall protect them. And they shall, listen, devour, prevail, and destroy and subdue, trample, overcome with our own sling rocks. And then they shall drink and make a noise, be boisterous. We'll become noisy like or as through with. They were happy with drinking wine. <laughs> They're intoxicated, and they shall be filled like the bowls of a sacrificial basin. They'll be drenched as the corners of an altar. Wow, what a picture. Verse 15. So in verse 15, we see here a fairly bloody scene. Whew. What a millennial battle, a bloody scene. I believe somewhere in the book of Revelation, it talks about this battle, you know, this, this fierce battle, uh, describing the battle of Armageddon, how it would be as if blood is running and it's, the blood is running so deep until the blood is measured up to the horse's bridle, the horse's legs, a horse chest. That's a bloody scene. And the Lord, okay. How about this? Now, I don't know last time we heard this in church. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes are wrapped a store. Got it? I forgot the other words, but you got it? His truth is marching on. His terrible, swift sword. Got it? Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. That's the scene. When God finally comes and delivers for sure, for real though, his people, Jews will destroy their enemies under the leadership of their king, Messiah. <laughs> and I, I think he, he, he pictures here uh, as if they are intoxicated with what God is doing. The imagery, the language the prophet used, uh, uh, the drinking, the swallowing, the consuming of if it were... Uh, uh, the drinking of the blood of wrath. And, and now, of course, to, to drink blood for anything would be an abomination to the Lord. 
Hmm. And certainly literally drinking human blood would be even worse. And so the Lord is being prophetic or poetic, not prophetic. He's being poetic. Got it? This is poetic language that the prophet is using about drinking or blood consuming. The destruction that the Jews will bring about under Jesus Christ's leadership would be a bloody bath. So much blood. It's as if the soldiers would drink, drink it and be making loud noises as they were enjoying the consumption. I'm going to stop. Bible prophecy. I'm just a mailman. Isn't this something? God giving us a picture. I don't care what they're going through right now. One day God going to come and he going he gonna to fight for his people. I want to be ready when he comes. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord let his face shine upon you. Be gracious unto you. May the Lord let his countenance just consume you and you enjoy his peace. Until next time, God bless you. Good evening, good night, good day, and shalom. Until next time. Remember, next week, last Bible study for 2022. Blessings and grace.